After I finished the presentation, the new treasurer turns to me and says, that's all well and good. However, you owe us $100,000 this past due. So we're gonna have you put on credit hold. This is a Friday afternoon. And you won't get any product until you pay that down. And then he and everybody Ouch. else got up and wow. left the room. And I thought, wow, I'm totally dependent on this company. They just fired a bullet at my head and I got nowhere to go. Hello and welcome to Million Dollar Monday. I'm your host, Greg Mazzello, bringing you real successful people with real useful advice for people with big dreams. I understand big dreams. I turned an investment of $200 and a lot of great advice from some really successful people into my big dream, Pro Forma, that today is a half billion dollar company. Hello and welcome. I am very excited for today because today is my first in-person Million Dollar Monday since we're hopefully on the uh, down slide, down end of this COVID experience we've all been through. And I can't think of a better guest to have to inspire those of you who are thinking about becoming entrepreneurs and give great ideas to those of you who have big dreams than an entrepreneur's entrepreneur. A man who started a business with $2,000 and grew it to $1.4 billion, but not only had entrepreneurial success, but has turned that entrepreneurial success and in learning into becoming a teacher of others today and a mentor to others today. I'm excited to welcome, and please join me in welcoming my good friend, Marty Schaffel. Marty. Welcome. Great to be here. I love your enthusiasm and uh, know that you inspire many people around the country oh, and around the world. Well, thank you for that. And so do you. So do you. I know that. So, you know, tell us a little about maybe your first bug or thought of owning your own business. I uh, went and got a, a job in uh, retail uh, management uh, uh, with uh, Montgomery Ward's department stores. Monkey Ward's. Yeah. For $9,800 a year in 1977. That was my first job, and uh, um, I was uh, out in the workforce. I was there. I showed up in a coat and tie, thinking I was going to be this junior executive. Mm -hmm. And the store manager laughed at me and said, uh, uh, you're a little overdressed today. I said, why is that? He said, well, your first two weeks are on the loading dock, and there's a tractor trailer full of 50-pound bags of fertilizer that just came in. Uh -huh. And we can't get a forklift on there, so you're going to unload them one at a time. So you were a management trainee, as they call them. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> got it. But I worked in every department, eventually got my own department. And during six months, I learned an amazing amount about, you know, the real world that isn't taught in the university environment or wasn't then. It is much more now. Uh, so uh, that was my first job. And I knew after two days I'd be doing something else, but uh, for six months I stuck it out and got a, a broad practical understanding of uh, how retail management works. Yeah. Probably more valuable going from department to department and everything that you learned uh, in growing your own business. Well, it was all practical experience. It was the loading dock. It was shipping and receiving. It was human resources. It was... Um, payables, it was receivables. It was, uh, you know, my first department, I managed a, a, a lawn and garden center, then a kitchenware department. So you know, I had unique experiences. Yeah. But, Almost like an entrepreneur training program. So get me to how did you start the company? Well, I then got recruited to go into sales, Okay, which I thought was the worst idea in my life. Uh, but I uh, got solicited uh, for a job in sales for, with Lanier Business Products. Uh, I had to move to Lakeland, Florida, and I would be selling a re, uh, kind of uh, fairly simple audio-visual type products like overhead projectors and slide projectors and so on uh, to schools, churches, businesses, and so on. But I also 
since it was my territory was mostly orange trees and cows, I also had the opportunity to sell copy machines to schools and churches. And nothing uh, will teach you sales uh, and give you sales experience better than that style of selling. Door to door, knocking on doors, Correct. field calling. Right. Yeah. A lost mm -hmm. art, I think. But right. Yeah. yeah. Right. And uh, that got me trained in, uh, in selling. So then I left and helped start a part of a business for somebody who was in the business. Uh, uh, I was constantly in a battle with my district manager at Linear. So we eventually got into a fight. He fired me. I went to work with this other guy who used to work there, started right. a competitive company, but uh, he wasn't paying the bills. Uh, so I was unable to get the products that I was making money on. And that's when I saw this one really cool new product that came into the marketplace and uh, went straight to the manufacturer and said, I want to start a, my own company selling this product. Tell us about that product, even though some of our younger folks might not be able to relate to it. But Very difficult to relate to it's because right. it doesn't exist anymore. And this was in 1979 when right. there were... Uh, no PCs. Right. There was only huge IBM computers mm -hmm. that would take up, you know, a building. But uh, uh, the PC hadn't come out yet, and um, it was uh, a machine that was about eighteen inches by eighteen inches by about twelve inches, and it literally gave you an opportunity to dial a number or a letter or a piece of or a punctuation. And it would imprint black letters on a scotch tape-like material. Okay. And you would take that strip and you would peel it away and you would put it on either an engineering drawing or a way to create a flyer or a newsletter or a, a presentation because none of that technology had come about yet. Now all that's done on a PC, but we didn't have PCs back then. So brilliant idea, great concept, a good market for it. And I was just thrilled with the idea, but I only had $2,000 left in my name. And uh, I called the company and I said, I want to buy 10 of these machines COD. And they said, uh, well, you know, do you have any credit? And I said, I was hoping to get a line of credit from you. And they said, well, no. They said, can you get a letter of credit? I said, no. And they said, uh, how are you going to pay for it? And I said, well, if you send it COD, I got to pay for it. COD doesn't exist anymore now because we pay everything in advance. But I got them to send me 10 machines COD, wrote a $10,000 checkout that had about $2,000 behind it, and gave myself 48 hours to get them all sold, uh, which I did. Yep. And uh, made $4,000 in those two days. And now I had $6,000. I bought another 10 machines, uh, did it again. Um, Check was about $4,000 light, but I got them all sold in 48 hours, made another $4,000. And then I bought another 10 machines, only that check was good. And then I bought another 10 machines, that check was good. And then I bought 20 machines, then I bought 50 machines. And after selling a few thousand of these, I uh, became one of the biggest in the country doing it. And it used a proprietary supply cartridge that had about a 43% profit margin. So anybody nice. who bought the machines would want to buy these cartridges. So had about a million dollar renewable uh, clientele of business uh, buying these supply cartridges. So that gave me a chance to then move the business under other areas. Uh, got into the early years of video equipment used for commercial applications, VCRs, camcorders, uh, editing equipment, all that which you know, we don't really use anymore, but uh, it was, there was, it was hot. It was, it was hot for yeah. several years. You know, it was flying uh, out the door and we did well with it. Then in 1988, a guy came, by then we were out of my apartment in Lakeland, uh, opened an office in Tampa by the airport, uh, where a guy came walking in the door with a very, very early Apple PC, a plastic picture frame with a piece of glass inside and a cable hanging out of it. And he said, if you have an overhead projector, which is, you know, the old technology from Everybody the day. Everybody had one back then. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
said, I want to show you something. And I said, okay. So I went and got an overhead projector. We went in the conference room. He took this plastic picture frame with the glass and put it on the overhead projector. He plugged the cable hanging out of it into this Apple PC, which was uh, one of the very early Apple portable computers. Plugged everything in, turned everything on, and the light coming out of the overhead projector went through the glass in this picture frame, which then projected up on the wall. And he, there, coming out of the computer, projected onto the, onto the wall, was black and white text. And I thought, wow, that's the way the world's going to communicate in the future. And I just said, we're going to shift our entire focus to display technology. And we became the world's biggest integrator and reseller of display technology for classrooms, conference rooms, boardrooms, war rooms. And uh, this year, the company will do $1.4 billion in revenue, I believe. You know, I heard a great story uh, that you told about a lesson that you learned about being one supplier dependent. Uh, I think there's a great lesson there. My rule, listeners. my rule is, and I had to learn it the hard way, no single customer and no single supplier can. Why? Tell, tell the why. What happened with that single supplier? Can dictate your um, business or you will be forced into making bad decisions or um, no decisions that you can possibly like. Uh, I had really committed so much of my revenue to this one supplier. Mm -hmm. And I would attribute a key part of my success to the credit manager mm -hmm. of this company, Croy Industries. Uh, she was smart enough to say, hey, this guy's keeping his promise. Now, he's building his business like so many of our customers. But he doesn't have the capital to, you know, to handle this volume. So if we cut him some slack, our sales will be greater as long as he keeps his promise. So what would happen is I was falling behind about $100,000. And she agreed to take that $100,000 and treat it as a pass due, almost like a loan. I would keep paying that down, but I was continually able to get product. So when I couldn't get a hundred thousand dollars loan from a bank, but I was selling a ton of their product, she was allowing this hundred thousand dollars to kind of roll, and everybody was happy in the deal. I was buying a lot of product. I was keeping my promises. They were selling me a lot of product, and that hundred thousand dollars wasn't at risk, but it was allowing me to grow. Well, one day a private mm -hmm. equity group took over the company, bought the company, had uh, new management new board of directors, and the salesman who was calling on me at the time, this was uh, early to mid 80s, uh, said, uh, listen, I need you to come to Arizona to visit uh, a company that's since moved to Arizona, to visit with the new ownership. And in the room was the new president of the company, the new treasurer of the company, the new chairman of the board, and the woman who was extending me this credit, the credit manager, and a few of the sales people. And I thought, hmm, good thing I planned a presentation here. This is a, uh, a lot of people in here. So I had stood up and did a presentation about, hey, started my business around your product. Here's the growth. Here's how much I'm generating. Here's what it means to all of us. Here's the role you play, how critical that is. And here's my go forward projections and why our partnership is so valuable for both of us. I thought, well, it's a home run presentation. After I finished the presentation, the new treasurer turns to me and says, that's all well and good. However, you owe us $100,000 that's past due. So we're going to have you put on credit hold. This is a Friday afternoon and you won't get any product until you pay that down. And then he and everybody Ouch. else got up and left wow. the room. And I thought, wow, I'm totally dependent on this company. They mm -hmm. just fired a bullet at my head and I got nowhere to go. Anyway, he drops me off at the hotel. I walk in the hotel room and I just collapse on the floor of the hotel wow. and I start hyperventilating. 
Here I am, 30 years old, and I think I'm having a heart attack. And I thought, you know, that's it. I'm going to lose the company. I'm going to lose everything. I have no solution to this problem. I don't have the $100,000. But uh, got back to town. Um, I had two uncles who were very helpful. I, I said, I need, I, I need $50,000 each from you for 90 days. Mm -hmm. So I could get the money in the bank to then borrow $100,000 to then, you know, pay this amount of money. And then I would use that uh, uh, indebtedness also to get you paid. And it took a lot of maneuvering, mm -hmm. but I was able to pull it off. I thought that I had lost the company. And I just thought all these people who were working for me, that were dependent on me for their livelihood, were, it was yeah, all about to, to blow yeah. up but we made it through. And, um, you know, it's interesting because you have to keep reinventing yourself along the way. And the thing that I learned at that moment was I had to reinvent myself as a business that would not be singularly dependent on a single customer the other key thing or a single you supplier. Was, you didn't give up. There was, I'm hearing and reading through the lines, there was no way you were going to give up. You were going to find a solution no matter what it took. You were going to get through the panic. You were going to get through the problem. And you were going to get to the other end of it. I think as I talk with different entrepreneurs and, and different people with dreams, I think that's what really differentiates people is the ability to run into a mountain, but to say, you know what? I don't know if I have to dig a tunnel. I don't have to go around it. I don't have to go over it, but somehow I'm getting through it. And, and uh, that's a... It's a tremendous attribute that I think separates the very successful from those that might not make it. Now, you and I also talked about when we were getting ready about when, at what point, or did you ever reach a point that you were had an unshakable confidence that you would be successful no matter what? Um, I think that you always believe you will be successful when you are absolutely um, convinced that if you get up every day and do the things you know are the right things to do, you will not fail. And as long as you're focused on those right things, and those right things are not the, the accumulation of wealth. The accumulation of wealth is a byproduct of getting up every day and doing the right things. But when you become focused on the money, you will have lost your ability to lead and to be an effective and successful entrepreneur. The money is the reward for getting up every day and being focused on doing the right things. And the ability to communicate to your employees that you lead or manage, what are those right things that need to be done every day? And that is when you eventually aspire to a place I call management nirvana. And by definition, that is, nobody was allowed to report to me that needed to be managed. What I wanted to do, and it took me 25 years to get there, is I wanted to be able to sit in a conference room with all of the key people that report to me and say, here's our objectives. Here's, they're all consistent with our uh, vision and mission. From our objectives comes our action plan. From our action plan, our, uh, from our objectives come our strategy. From our strategy comes our action plan. And when we get up, everybody knows what they own, what they're going to do, when they're going to do it. And I don't have to walk behind them and ask them. And when you're at that point, you have reached what I believe to be management nirvana. You can spend your time strategizing and leading rather than Parenting. <laughs> I call that owning a lifestyle business. So many people, and I try to talk to them, talk with our franchise owners all the time about the goal, if you want it to be, I don't like shooting on people, but it, the goal could be building a business to the point that you're not the most important person in the business anymore. I think you're kind of saying the same thing, but you're making money because you own the business, not because you're the most important worker in the business. And, and I think for a lot of smaller entrepreneurs, they don't necessarily see that. I think they see that I either need to work really hard and keep making money or I need to sell the business. And there's like nothing in between. And yet you found that sweet spot where 
you didn't have to be the most important in many ways you were of course the most important but you didn't have to be the most important person in the business you could go travel and turn on your computer and live the life you wanted and yet still own the business and be involved in the business and i i you know i call that a lifestyle business i like the word nirvana much better though <laughs> your goal has to be to motivate, inspire, and impassion people to execute on a dream and a vision. Uh, that's, that's your goal. That's your job description. That's what you have to get up and do every day. And to the extent that you can create a mutual uh, loyalty mm -hmm. between yourself and your employees that each knows you take a bullet for the other and that you're, and the employee is not just a uh, expendable or disposable artifact, uh, which way too many businesses fail because they have that mentality. If you can make it very clear that your goal is to inspire and passion and empower employees, you will have a very dynamic organization. Now, how do you impassion or inspire employees? Well, they have to feel significant. If you can cause your employees to feel important and significant and you empower them to make a decision, most entrepreneurs fail because they can't get to that point where they can delegate, where they can empower. It is a and big step. You're right. If you don't, a dynamic organization has people making decisions. A, a paralyzed organization has people afraid to make a decision. So I would tell our employees, you cannot be fired from this company for any decision you make. And we need you to make decisions. As long as when you made the decision, you truly believed it was right for the customer, the company, your fellow employees, and not out of greed, self-aggrandizement, ego, or something else, then no matter what the outcome, we will not be a dynamic organization if you don't make decisions. Right. Now, the entrepreneur has to buy into this and the entrepreneur has to say, you know what? I'm willing to let that person make a decision that may only generate 80% of the effectiveness that maybe my decision would make because I can get a lot more decisions made. And if the entrepreneur is willing to do that, they're gonna, and the leader is willing to do that, they're gonna find more often than not, the person executed it at 110 or 120 percent of the way they would have executed if they'd have tried to do it themselves. Wise advice and a great culture. What you're talking about really is building a great culture. All right. Congratulations on the great success. Talk to us just a little bit about when did you reach the decision to sell the business? How did you get there and what did you do? Um, I never wanted to sell the company. Wasn't okay. trying to sell the company. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, um, one of my quirks was I was so concerned about how we sounded to the public. Most people didn't come to see us. We did business to business. Uh, but my office was always closest to the receptionist because I wanted to hear how we sounded to the public. It was just always one of my quirks. And um, I was getting so frustrated back in 2003 because I was having people constantly call saying, I have a buyer for your business, or I'm a business broker, I want to sell your business, on and on and on and on. So finally, and I never would tell the receptionists to screen calls, but I said, you got to screen these calls, they're killing me. And one day, a call got through, and uh, the voice said, I have somebody who wants to buy your company. And I said, how'd you get through? I said, I have stopped these calls. Okay. And she said, no, no, I really have somebody who wants to buy your company. Okay. I said, great, who is it? She said, well, you have to sign an NDA. I said, I'm going to hang up in 30 seconds if you don't tell me who it is. And she said, no, 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 if I could just send you the NDA, I said, 10 seconds. Finally, uh, as we're counting down to zero, she, okay, okay, I'll tell you. It's Circuit City. Oh. I said, hmm, that's interesting, a public company. She said, they have hired us to find acquisitions for them. And we're most interested in your company, biggest in the space you're in. And I said, that's very interesting. And I said, um, uh, tell me more. They said, we have to sign an NDA. <laughs> I said, all right. Right in the middle of the discussion, they had a 
jet full of eight of their senior procurement people crash into a mountain in Colorado. Everybody was killed. Oh, no. And uh, it was Pueblo, Colorado. And I called the CEO, offered my condolences, and said, I can only imagine the panic and confusion and challenges you got. He said, yep, yeah, we're going to have to stop this discussion. I got a mess on my hands. And um, then right after that, the uh, investment banking group that had uh, introduced us okay. said, uh, we've decided to cancel our relationship with uh, uh, Circuit City and just represent you in the sale of your company. I said, number one, I said, I'm, I, I'm not for sale. It just so happened there was an interesting story here, but I'm not for sale. And the guy said or asked the most important question that I've ever heard posed to me in my career in terms of timing. He said, well, let me ask you this. He said, will you just promise me if I have a similar interesting story like the Circuit City story we brought to you. Mm -hmm. Will you take my call? Good question. And I said, of course I'll take your call. I said, I would be a fool. I said, it just has to be as compelling a story as you just brought to me. And six months later, he calls me and says, I got the compelling story. You want to hear it? And I said, what is that? He said that we would merge. You're the biggest in the world. We would merge the second biggest in the world. Together, that would be uh, seven times bigger than the largest in the world. Okay. You would have an overwhelming dominance in the marketplace. And uh, we would you know, market that combined company to either a private equity group or a strategic buyer that would pay a premium to have that advantage. That's a great story. And he said, we will go into the marketplace with that story. And it will command a huge premium. I said, you got my attention? And I said, um, I'm willing to listen. He said, well, everybody wants to meet up in Baltimore. You know, the uh, private equity group that is involved in okay. this other company and, um, you know, people from our team. He said, you know, we got people from San Francisco and Boston and Baltimore, and they all want to know whether you'll fly to any one of those cities. I said, quite frankly, I said, if you think the story is good enough, you can fly to Tampa. That's where I'll be. And I'm not flying anywhere else. Call me when they can come. They said, oh, they're not. I said, call me when everybody wants to fly to Tampa and I'll hold the meeting. Calls me back and said, OK, they all want to come. Uh, December two th or October uh, 31st, uh, 2005. I said, that's Halloween. I said, I have an eight year old daughter. I take her trick or treating. <laughs> Good for you. They said, this is in a critical meeting, hundreds of millions of dollars at stake here. I said, it's Halloween. I said, arrive at three o'clock. We'll sit on my terrace at my home. We'll have a good Cuban cigar. We'll drink good scotch. But at six o'clock, I'm taking my daughter trick or treating. Got it? All right. Everybody shows up at three o'clock. We start the discussions at six o'clock. Tap, tap, tap. You look at the glass fringe doors on my patio. There's my eight-year-old daughter in a squirrel oh. outfit with a plastic orange oh. pumpkin going, knocking on the That's glass, saying it's time yeah, to go yeah, trick-or-treating. Yeah. So I turned to everybody and said, guys, help yourself to another cigar, more scotch. Uh, I'll be back in an hour or two. I got to take my daughter trick-or-treating. And they said, you're nuts. I said, I got my priorities. Of all the stories you've told, by the way, Marty, I didn't know that story, uh, and we've been friends for some time. It, I think that story tells me the most about who you are as a man. I love that story. Uh, we've obviously gotten to know each other through the entrepreneurship program at the University of Florida. You give your heart and soul to that place as a teacher, as a mentor to many other. You've sold your business for a lot of money, uh, starting with a $2,000 investment. Um, now, you're very successful. You've achieved probably beyond your wildest dreams. What are the big dreams or dreams that you have for the rest of your life? Well, uh, there is a philanthropist in town that has a quote that I share with um, all my classes. I make sure 
Every semester I tell my students this quote, and the gentleman's name is Les Muma, M-U-M-A, and I heard him say, you spend the first third of your life learning, you spend the second third of your life earning, and you spend the last third of your life returning. Nice. And nice. I am now in that third phase of my life where I still want to continue to learn, but I'm most concerned about returning. And I made my business successful because not because of what specifically we did, because it didn't matter to me. It could have been toilets for all I was concerned, plumbing supplies. It wasn't what we did that enamored me. It was the ability to hire great people and motivate and impassion them and enthuse them to be successful. And I knew if I could help enough other people be successful, I would be successful. Well, the challenge comes in once you sell your company, mm -hmm. once I sold my company, I wasn't causing people to be successful anymore. I had handed that over to other people. And there is a concept that is really important for all of us to understand. And that concept is, what is our relevancy? We all need to feel relevant. And we find our relevancy in different ways. Sometimes it's as a parent. Sometimes it's as a spouse or a significant other. Sometimes it is as a teacher, mentor, motivator, or leader. And that's where we derive our feeling of accomplishment. So my relevancy was helping people be successful. Once I was no longer doing that at AVISPL, I then found that I could do that at the University of Florida, joining the faculty and teaching. Mm -hmm. And that is now my relevancy, helping students be successful and be ready to get out in the world and make a difference. And I make it very clear to them that they have to commit to me, that they will let me know how they're doing over the next 10 years, and that they will know that they have two more thirds of their life left to execute on and that never forget to say thank you. One of the things that I did when I got that first check for 80% of my okay. shareholdings, I took $10 million, carved it up into small checks and called in employees one by one who had helped me get to where I got to and nice. handed them a check and said, thank you, we got here together. I couldn't have done it without you. Classic. And this is a thank you from me to you. And we hugged and we cried. And I said, now, when you leave my office, please don't cry because everybody knows that, you know, that transaction happened yesterday and I don't want them seeing, I don't want them seeing you leave my office crying to think I'm firing everybody. I won't be able to get anybody in here <laughs> to give them a chat. <laughs> that is a great story. I said, so when a student raised their hand in class one time and said, what was the greatest day in your career? Uh -huh. Was it the day you got all that money? I said, nah. I said, that was a good day. May have been the second That's best day of my day. career, but it wasn't the best day of my career. Yeah. The best day of my career was that next day when I handed out checks and thanked people because uh, I took 10% of my uh, net earnings and uh, wrote a check to everybody. Well, good for you. It is a great story. I think somehow the word nirvana continues to ring in my head about you and your life. You talked about achieving management nirvana, but now I just think you've reached lifetime nirvana. And you're just, you're living a life of wonderful dreams because you were brave enough to pursue yours and yet continue to stay in touch with helping others now pursue their dreams. So I really appreciate your joining me. I hope each of you enjoyed listening to Marty. I hope you got a lot of rich lessons out of it. One of the lessons I think that I would encourage you to hear is that Marty was a great listener. And I hope you heard him say about putting his office closest to the receptionist and 
Tie that together with the opportunities that walked in his door, that machine one day that he was willing to take a look at that turned the future and the fortunes of his company. He always was a great listener. And in listening, rather than closing your mind and being too important for the next person that has something to say, it is in careful listening to prospective vendors, prospective our current employees, and all other folks in our life that the best lessons and maybe sometimes the best opportunities come our way. Anyhow, thank you all for joining me. I hope this Million Dollar Monday was great for you. And once again, thank you again, Marty. Love being with you as always.